Footage has emerged of a woman being publicly whipped in Sudan for wearing trousers. The video offers a rare glimpse of the type of punishment inflicted on women who break the country's strict morality code. The governor of Khartoum said the woman had been punished under Sharia law. But now this report by Tim Marshall contains violent images from the beginning of that woman being beaten. <laughs> A frequent occurrence, very rarely for Sudan's president is Omar Bashir, who's wanted for alleged war crimes. He took power in a coup in 1989. Two years later, he extended Sharia laws. They are enforced by his puritanical public order police. They seek out what are known as trouser girls. Despite claims of morality, they have a reputation for dishonesty. And this is the most renowned executioner in Saudi Arabia, who carries out the executions. His sword delineates the border between seriousness and play. There is no negotiating with him once the heads have ripened. When his heart... Construction companies, he said, until they cut off his hand. His alleged crime? Stealing a motorbike. On his remaining wrist, he carries a little bag of antibiotics and bandages. You see, before, my whole arm was this thick, but the doctors had to cut in and remove flesh because it was infected. That's why it's so thin here. You can see my bones. All the flesh is gone. It hurts, and I feel as if my bones are coming out. Then his friend appeared. Another of the 20 or so men who lost a hand, or a hand and foot, amputated under the harsh Sharia punishments the jihadis introduced in Gao. Neither man knows how he'll support his family now. They were amputated here, at the stadium, where the people of Gao watched basketball matches, until the men of Mujao, the movement for jihad and unity, which ruled the town for nine months, turned it into a punishment ground. The sand has turned black. Local men told me this is where jihadis ground cigarettes into the earth and flogged smokers, just outside the mayor's office, which they used as an Islamic court. Inside one of the buildings, the floor was littered with documents outlining Sharia statutes and rules. People showed me the jackets worn by the Islamic police who were supposed to catch serious criminals. And those of the Hezba or justice enforcers who combed the town looking for women who weren't covered. When people were arrested, they were brought to this small room, dozens of them, and it was here they were tied and flogged. I've just picked up this file on the floor. I'm told that these are the names of women who were flogged for not wearing hijab, the veil, and men flogged for smoking. The thumbprints 
are from their family members who were forced to come here and say that they would now keep an eye on those people who'd been punished. And if they did the same again, the punishment would be much, much worse. The U.S. has deemed death by stoning a barbaric and abhorrent act, a slow form of execution in which an individual is ruthlessly killed by having stones thrown again and again. It continues in many parts of the world, including Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Afghanistan. But now a new video reports to show a stoning in northwest Pakistan, a woman being stoned to death by Taliban militants, allegedly. The video was obtained by Al An, a television station in Dubai that focuses on women's issues in the Arab world. It's so disturbing we can only show parts of it. The woman is tethered to the ground in what we are told is the upper region of the Orixai province of Pakistan. She appears to cling to life as men repeatedly throw stones at her. Her crime allegedly being seen out with a man. Now we're not able to independently verify the authenticity of the tape or its forensics, but Al An Television says the video was smuggled out by a member of the Taliban who attended the stoning approximately two months ago. Joining me now is Gail Lamont, the Deputy Director of Women and Foreign Policy Program at the Council on Foreign Relations, who focuses on the treatment and role of them in Afghanistan. Thank you very much for being here. You've seen that tape. What do you make of it? Uh, I think this is what happens when you have Taliban-controlled areas, right? I mean, I think women face punishments such as stonings, lashings, beatings for without trial, without ever getting a say, and that's their version of justice. Uh, it was said to us that it was smuggled out by someone and given to this uh, women's station in Dubai. It seems authentic to you? It does. Uh, it's really hard to tell. I mean, I think with these tapes, it's very difficult to know when and where exactly they were shot. But I, is it consistent with videos that have been coming from Taliban-controlled areas since the 90s? Yes. And, and why is that approach? Give our, our viewers a sense of why the Taliban uh, treats women this way. You know, I don't think the Taliban universally treat women this way, but this is their version of the law. They have a view of the ideal time of Islam being at the t their version of the 7th century, right. uh, at the time when uh, Islam's founding. And they think that this is what happens to women, that, you know, as carriers of honor, anytime they stray outside the line, they must face severe punishments, slashing, beatings, stonings, and that's their version of justice. And men face the same kind of very tough justice from the Taliban as carriers of honor though. So women are in a sense held in higher regard yeah. and pay a price for it. That's right. That's right. I mean it's also it's it's quite positive in the sense that women are viewed and respected in terms of carriers of the family honor, but it also means that they can pay the price for men's crimes uh, and they can pay the price for being seen without any kind of proof as straying outside the lines. And in this case there's no indication that the man she was seen with right. was similarly punished. That's right, and it, it happens, you know, sometimes the man is punished, sometimes uh, he isn't, but in every case the woman is punished. So what does that mean for women who face the prospect of uh, Taliban control in Pakistan and Afghanistan? They were through it in Afghanistan. That's right. And, you know, I think it depends on who and where, you know, the Taliban has never been monolithic, but if you're going to talk about largely Taliban controlled areas, sure, you'll see more of the same. The U.S. has certainly used the argument that women will suffer under the Taliban as part of its effort to win the hearts and minds. Yes. Uh, in Afghanistan and to some extent in Pakistan. Is that an effective argument? Uh, is that really credible? That this kind of thing would be coming? I think it's credible. Whether it's effective remains to be seen. I think this government has had a very difficult time outlining the objectives and the aims of this war in Afghanistan. And people don't know. Are women a reason? Are women not a reason? Are we supposed to believe that? Are we not? Is this spin? And I think, you know, when you meet women in Afghanistan who are really seizing the opportunity of these past eight years and creating for themselves, you know, real opportunities in business and civil society and politics, you, you feel that, yes, this is a real reason. Um, but I think it's hard for that message to get through to the American public. And what about in Pakistan? Do they fear this is coming to them? It's a westernized country in many respects for women. I think it depends. I think in the cities people have tended to see this as a very isolated case that does not affect Islamabad or you know, Karachi. But I think the more that they see videos like this, the more you see examples of a case that was in Pakistan not too long ago of a young woman who was lashed for not marrying a Taliban commander, um, the more people get very concerned and women in particular who are very vocal in Pakistan get concerned. 
When the Muslim world reacted in fury over the Danish cartoons of Mohammed, this was the face of moderation that European Muslim leaders wanted the world to see. The mainstream Muslims living in this uh, country want to show that we can express our protest in a very legitimate, in a very civil, in a very courteous way. But this is the other face of European Islam. This is footage of the demonstration outside the Danish Embassy in London, provided to CBN News by the NIFA Foundation, an anti-terrorism group. What you can't see in this video is that one of the demonstrators is dressed as a suicide bomber. Even moderate British Muslims were outraged that no one was arrested, even though British law forbids incitement to murder. But it follows a pattern of extraordinary and some would say dangerous tolerance of Muslim radicals. If you do not pull your troops out, you will get bloodshed on the streets of London. Again, no one was arrested, and moderate Muslims tried to keep the media from publicizing what for them has become a public relations nightmare. Yeah, that's disgusting. I mean, it doesn't serve any purpose. These guys don't represent me. They probably don't represent most Muslims in this country, and they do a disservice not only to, you know, living here in the UK, but they do a major disservice to Muslims. They may not represent the views of most British Muslims, but polls do suggest the Muslim middle is radicalizing. A recent survey shows that 40% of British Muslims want Islamic Sharia law in the United Kingdom. Sharia imposes punishments like amputations and stonings. And in a separate poll, nearly one-third of Muslims agreed with the statement that Western society is decadent and immoral and that Muslims should seek to bring it to an end. Critics say that European political correctness and multiculturalism, which were supposed to embrace Muslim radicals and somehow westernize them, have seriously backfired. And now Western Europe seems paralyzed by the political correctness that grips the government and the media. One of the biggest fears for a lot of commentators, whether they're terrorist commentators or commentators on the Middle East, is if they actually address this whole issue of Islam and start to question it, what they fear is being labelled as an Islamophobe. There is a, a real reluctance to offend the ethnic communities of any sort, let alone the Muslim community. And there seems to be a lack of political will to stop Muslim radicals bent on conquest. The Dutch parliament has tried to strike a blow against radical Islam by voting to ban the burqa and veils. But that exposes unveiled women to being raped by Muslim men as punishment. There is reported to be a growing rape epidemic of unveiled women in Europe. In London, Shadow Homeland Security Director Patrick Mercer of the Conservative Party says Britain remains in denial and thinks it is protected by what he calls pointless legislation. But you have to ask yourself, what is a piece of paper going to do to an Islamist fundamentalist or any other form of fundamentalist terrorist for that matter and its suicide bombers? Are you going to be able to hold this up in front of them and say, don't blow yourselves up, otherwise we'll, we'll get really cross? In France, the government continues to pretend that Muslim anti-Semitic violence is not a problem, but it couldn't keep tens of thousands of Frenchmen from marching last month after the brutal murder of a young Jew named Ilan Halimi by French Muslims. Halimi was held for ransom and then tortured to death by Muslim immigrants who phoned his family and recited to them verses from the Koran as their son screamed in agony. French conservative political writer Guy Millier. A lot of Jews in Europe and especially in France are really scared about the future. Uh, I have many Jewish friends and uh, they say to me, we think we shall have to leave France to go to the United States, to Canada, to Israel, but France will not be our country anymore. It's a similar story all over Europe. And in the wake of the cartoon protest, a worldwide group of intellectuals recently signed a declaration that states, After having overcome fascism, Nazism, and Stalinism, the world now faces a new global threat, Islamism. It is not a clash of civilizations nor an antagonism of West and East that we are witnessing, but a global struggle that confronts Democrats and theocrats. 
And Europe's problem with radical Muslims is our problem too. Hello and welcome to Jack Ben MB Presents. You know, friend, Sharia law is something we've been dealing with for several weeks now and such an important subject. Well, God's called me to warn the people, uh, Ezekiel 33, 3, and I want to tell you, Sharia is dangerous and Islam wants to take over the new world order and a one world religion soon. And so much research for us about Sharia law. It's important for us to know what's going on in the world. In fact, Jack read over 20 books and did about 1,500 documentaries for this uh, particular program and programs that we will be doing. The sources that he went to are so authentic. And uh, I showed you some of the books last week, but here are some more. Inside the Revolution, and this is by Joel Rosenberg. And then going on, there he is, of course. He has a lot to say about how the followers of jihad are certainly putting down Christianity. 500 pages. Yes, and Sharia law for non-Muslims also. Forward by Adrian Rogers, and this is by Jim Merck. Islam rising the never-ending jihad against Christianity. And Islam rising the never-ending jihad against America and the West. Now, you know, I do want to ask Jack. I know he does research for all of our programs, and that is why so many of the networks really enjoy having him because he backs it up with international headlines. But Jack, why do you do all the research on this particular subject? Because 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says, Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. And I've got the mind where everything has to be proven to me, and so I read all these volumes. And you know that of over 1,500 different quotations from leaders concerning Islam. So anything I say in the next six, seven, eight weeks, I can back. Well, you know, Jack, we have dealt with Chrislam, and I want to take a look at something that I think is very, very, very important. Has Christianity become confused? How missionaries are promoting an Islamized gospel through Chrislam. Going on, New Bible Yanks, Father, Jesus as Son of God. Now, that is the new Bible that we're going to talk about. Wycliffe defends changing titles for God. And then, Jack, a, another question. Why have they changed the Bible for missionaries overseas, the new translations? Wycliffe and Sill and Frontiers, they've joined together in changing the Bible and making Jesus no longer the Son of God. Because it's one of the final signs that there's going to be a great apostasy away from true biblical Christianity. And these groups have really done it. You know what they've done with Matthew 28, 19? That says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Because you can't have a son now in our Bible because that would go against Allah who had no children. God forgive these apostate backsliders. Now, listen carefully. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Who wrote this book? Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, Second Peter 1, 21. Because of it, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You know what they changed that wonderful verse to? Go ye therefore and cleanse them in the name of Allah, his prophet, Makti, and his spirit. What blasphemy. Now, here's what they've done with the word of God. They've made 91 changes in their new updated Bible that eliminates Christ as the Son of God. And they said before, why? Because Allah had no kids. I don't care what Allah had or didn't have. He's not our God. My God is Yahweh. Some call him Jehovah. And Jesus is the second member of the Trinity, God from all eternity. Micah 5, 2. And how plain it is that Christ is God, 
this very day, great is the mystery of Godless that God was manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16. We have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life, 1 John 5.20. So they are doing dangerous things with this Holy Bible. Yes, they certainly are, Jack. Now, while I was listening to him, I couldn't help but wonder about something. What they're doing, is this apostasy? Is this literally blasphemy, Jack? Would you call it that? Oh, it really is. We've got a warning from God here. You know who wrote the book of Revelation? The Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 22, 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to teach these things to you, the 22 chapters of the book of Revelation, to the churches. But what's happened? Apostasy. Listen to the verse 18. I testify unto every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add to these things, God shall add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man take away from the words of the prophecy of this book, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and from the holy city and from the things written in this book. You are very prone to lose your own soul at that day because of what you've done to the Holy Word of God. Now, let me give you what they've done, all right? Is Jesus the Son of God? As mentioned 91 times, Christianity is built on that foundation. In Matthew 16, beginning with verse 13, Jesus is talking. He says, Whom do men say that I am? And they said, Some say you're Elias and a prophet. He said, But Peter, who do you say I am? And the apostle Peter said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, Peter, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto you, Peter, that on this rock, your statement about me being the Christ, the Son of God, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But the gates of hell are trying through these guys that I've given over to Islam. And someone said, boy, Wycliffe dislikes you. They're angry. Praise the Lord. Get right with God and get your Bible back where it belongs. Then you won't have to hate me, but I'm going to speak up for Jesus. I'm to endeavor to keep the faith. Jude verse 3, and I'm going to do it. I'll pay any price to do it. Now, is he the son of God? God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. He that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath, wrath of God abides on him. And that's not only here, but for eternity. John 20, verses 30 and 31. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and by believing that he's the Son of God, you may have life through his name. In Romans 8, 32, it talks about God sending forth his Son. Why? To die for our sins. So it says, God spared not his son on Calvary's cross. He made sure that he said that he was his son. Now listen to this one. This is Hebrews 1.8. Oh, this is rich. The father speaking to his son said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The father not only calls his son God, but he says you're going to reign on the throne when Matthew 6.10 is accomplished. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Listen to 1 John 5, 11 to 13. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that has the Son has life. He that does not have the Son does not have the life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know, not hope so, guess so, think so, know that you have eternal life. Why? Believing on the Son. Now, here is a book on Chrislam, all right? I looked through it a minute ago. Ninety-five of the greatest Christian theologians have put this masterpiece together, how missionaries are promoting an Islamized gospel, and that, of course, is Wycliffe, Frontier, and Sill. Now, this is the Quran, page 181. 
The Quran anathematizes, curses, and damns anyone daring to say that Jesus is the Son of God, guaranteeing if they do, they will go to hell. Now, you don't believe that's in the Quran eight times. Chapter 4, verse 165, chapter 5, verse 18, chapter 6, 101, chapter 9, verse 30, chapter 17, verse 111, chapter 19, verse 35, and verses 88 to 92, and chapter 23, verse 91. You go to hell if you believe that he's a son. Now, wait a minute. Let's take God's holy word. He is Antichrist who denies the father and son relationship. Which book are you going to believe, the Quran or the word of God? Amen. Thank you for Jesus. Oh, Jack, that was tremendous, wasn't it? He gave us the whole gospel. The whole gospel is centered around our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, last week he said that he was going to be discussing how Rick Warren has tried to show the similarities. How about that one, Jack? Well, you want to elaborate a little bit on it? The Orange County Register in California had a big article on it, how he's called in the Muslim imams and his own clergy to study the Quran and Bible together to see all these similarities. What? Now you're going to find some of the blasphemous dissimilarities, Mr. Warren. Yes, well, let's, let's take about 10 of them. Now, Jack has already answered that first one, and that has to do with Jesus being the Son of God. They don't believe that he was. So, Jack, you've already answered that first one about Jesus yeah. is the Son of God. Secondly, number two, Jesus never died on the cross for the sins of mankind. They don't believe that he died on the cross, do they? Colossians 1.20, he made peace through the blood of his cross. First Peter 2.24, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on a tree, on a cross. You can't miss it, ladies and gentlemen. Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. How to become our Savior? On a cross. Now, the Quran, according to them, teaches that Jesus is not the Savior of the world, the Savior. First John 4.14, God sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost, Luke 19.10. Uh, Jack, one thing they agree with us on, and that is that Jesus is coming back again. But they believe that when Jesus comes back, he will come back as a radical Muslim. Oh, that's ridiculous. The Bible says Christ cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him, Revelation 1, 7. And that's when he comes to set up his kingdom for 1,000 years in Revelation chapter 19 as he returns as the King of kings and Lord of lords to rule and reign for 10 centuries, Revelation 20, verse 4, under the banner of Christianity. All right, let's see what the Bible says on this one. Number five, that when Jesus comes back, he comes back to just outside Damascus. Is that right? Well, Zechariah 14, 4 says that Christ's feet hit the Mount of Olives just in front of Jerusalem. You're wrong again. And he comes back subordinate to the Muslim Messiah, Mahdi. Ay, 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 Philippians 2, verses 10, 11. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven, things on earth, and things under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. No, Mukti is going to be subordinate to Jesus. And you know what, Jack, they teach? That Jesus is going to rule under divine law, Sharia law. I think he'd rather do it the Judeo-Christian way, the Ten Commandments of Exodus 20, verses 3 to 17. All right, and Jesus becomes a great Muslim evangelist that he goes around preaching for the Muslim faith. Oh, that's really unbelievable, Rexel. In the light of what Jesus said in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, and the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come unto the Father but by me, here and now and forever. And forever. And this will break your heart as it does mine, that Jesus is going to testify against Christians, the ones who called him the Son of God. I gave it before I give it again, First John 2, 22. 
He is an antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. So Jesus isn't going to go against his own word, against the precious book, the eternal book. And you know who's going to abolish Christianity? According to number 10 here, Jesus is going to abolish Christianity. Let me quote the best verse in the Bible. It just blesses my heart. I already quoted it a couple phrases back. Philippians 2, 10 and 11, that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven, on the earth, under the earth. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. You've got it all wrong, Rick Warren. And I'm sorry for all the preachers across the world who are following you and listening to you. All ten things that we just said are not true. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He died on the cross. He's coming back again. He's going to be Savior of all the world if only they'll put their faith and trust in him you know thy kingdom come thy will be done if ever i wanted the lord to come back i would love to see him come back now because of the way so many things across the world are happening thy will be done oh wonderful to know he's coming back again he pr you know friends i would really like for jack to explain something terror on trial take a look please if you will at this picture this is from the Wall Street Journal. Now, there are legal proceedings against violent extremists, and you're going to see one right now. Jack, I'd like for you to explain this man Give us his who name, is Rexella. on trial right okay, now. Okay, thank you. This is Caliph Sheikh Mohammed. Man, keep that on there because I've got a story to tell you. This man is the one who did 31 tragedies against the Christians around the world under the leadership of bin Laden, who's now dead. This is the man who had Dan Pearl beheaded and held up the head and said, I did it. This is the man that was the mastermind of 9-11. He arranged the planes, everything else, to kill 3,000 of our people. And ladies and gentlemen, this man attended a Christian college in America. All right, Sharia law. Where does it lead, friends? Where does it really go? What does it produce? Does it give us democracy or what? Here you see Sharia law. Now, democracy is impossible in most of the Arab world going on. Egypt's new president moves against democracy. We always thought he was for it. And then Egypt group pushes for Islamic law. Well, Hillary Clinton had a lot to say about that. The time has come, and this is what she's saying. For the international community not only to reject the United Nations re resolution protecting blasphemy laws, but to directly condemn blasphemy laws as violations of freedom of religion and speech. Amen. Thank you, Hillary. And then, Jack, would you like to read this? The threat is... Sharia. The enemy adheres to an all-encompassing Islamic political, military, legal doctrine known as Sharia. Sharia obliges them to engage in jihad to achieve the triumph of Islam worldwide through the establishment of a global Islamic state governed exclusively by Sharia under a restored caliph. That's a re relative of Muhammad's. Still Obama's top counter terrorism advisor John Brennan insists that the president of America does not accept that there is a global war with Islamic terrorists. Oh my. And then going on here, friend, you'll see it. Muslims demanding revolution Sharia law. Now two radical Muslims who have set up a base of operations in the United Kingdom are calling for a revolution in India and then airlift to rescue 2,000 behind Sharia curtain. Now, that is in South Sudanese. And those are Christians. They're yes, getting out they of there before they kill them. Muslims announce plans to eradicate. You see that? Eradicate, not get along with, Christianity. Iran preparing Mahdi special forces. And, oh, friends, this one is so, so important, showing how America is in danger. Shocking new reports are coming out of Iran. A defector from Iran has revealed that their revolutionary guards are using mosques around the globe, including some in the United States, as terror command centers, including mosques in New York, New Jersey, and Ohio. 
as long as America exists, we will not rest. America, we are in trouble, I believe. We are, Rexella. Wake America. Romans 13, verses 11 and 12. Now listen to me. Should we have anything to do with the Sharia law? Shall we unite as one as some of our clergymen who are away from God are encouraging us to do? Absolutely not. Romans 16, 17, mark them which cause the visions and offenses contrary to the doctrine of Christ you have received and avoid them. Ephesians 5, 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather approve them. Why? Because they who teach these things are connected with the spirit of Antichrist. I repeat, first. John 2.22. All out of the Bible, Jack, and something else out of the Bible, friends. This is why we're in your home. We would love for you to have peace in a troubled world. And the only way you can is to have the Prince of Peace, the Savior of the world, the forgiver of sins, come into your heart.